Okay. All righty. Howdy, everyone. Welcome to this week's Seaside Chat. I am so glad you could all join us. Um, this week's speaker is Nicole Pilson, who is a Texas Sea Grant um, County agent in Matagorda. Um, Nicole is going to be talking to us about the effects of the recent freeze on coastal fish. And I am super excited to learn more about this topic. And yeah, thank you so much, Nicole, for joining us. Awesome. Thank you, Chloe, for getting this set up. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Hope you're wearing your green. Um, thanks for choosing to hang out with me for a little bit today. Like Chloe said, my name is Nicole Pilson. I'm the Matagorda County Marine Extension Agent. Um, I've been in this position for about a year and a half, and I'm really excited to talk to you all today a little bit and be with you, even if it's virtually, but you know, such is life right now. So today I thought I'd... Um, talk about the recent freeze. I thought that was kind of prudent and see what it did to um, the Texas coast and the fish in it, wild and farm raised populations. I think we're gonna start off with a poll. So if y'all don't mind filling that out, I think Chloe will go ahead and put that up. We'll give you a couple minutes to do that. Shouldn't be too hard. Oh, I got it too. I can't vote, just kidding. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you for filling that out. I do appreciate it. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Sorry, you're gonna hear my emails go off. I'm so sorry. Um, let me see if I can do this. Share, hooray. Okay, um, Chloe, I'm sure will let me know if y'all cannot see this. I'm gonna actually go ahead and maybe not, let me see. I'm gonna stop my video because y'all don't need to see me, that's for sure. Okay. So, as I said, we're going to talk about the freeze effects on our Texas fish. And to begin, I kind of wanted to go ahead and set the stage. Um, if you're from Texas, if you're tuning in from Texas, you know what happened, but maybe some of y'all aren't. And I thought we would just go over it, or maybe we just wanted to relive that experience together. So, as we know, winter storm Yuri rolled in and brought in lots of snow and ice across all of Texas. And honestly, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't excited to see the little snowflakes in the forecast on my weather app, um, although little did I know how much I'd be eating my words. So much to the dismay of many Texans, uh, we did not really get those fun snow days we were hoping for, nothing like the movies we were really lied to. Um, instead, temperatures were in the teens and wind chill made it even lower than that in many places. In fact, some places got into the negatives, which is terrible, no thank you. Uh, and the water, of course, was no different and temperatures were frigid. Sorry, one second, um, I'm seeing the chat pop up. Okay, never mind. sorry about that. So like I said, the water was no different. The air was very cold, meaning that the bays were going to be very cold as well. And this event affected the whole Texas coast. However, some areas experienced colder water temperatures than others. If you look at our table here on the right, and these temperatures are provided by Texas Parks and Wildlife, um, you'll see how different kind of those temperature ranges were. If you look here at Port O'Connor on that first day, um, it got below freezing. That's, that's crazy that we saw those temperatures in the bay. Um, and I think you'll see a picture later on of um, the bay behind my house. It was, it was frozen over, that was super crazy. So uh, like I said, the whole coast was impacted but not impacted the same way in every area. Uh, for example, the upper and Lago lower Laguna Madres saw the highest numbers of deceased fish. Um, and this is in part due to water just being shallower there. In contrast to Matagorda, where there are deeper pockets for fish to escape to. If you've been to the beach in the heat of summer, you know that shallow water is considerably warmer than that more cool, refreshing water as you go further out. You know, the water where you're like your mom would yell at you, hey, come back, that water, it was always a little cooler. 
And of course this applies to cold weather, uh, but of course in reverse, right? So the shallower water is gonna be a lot colder than that deeper water. And we'll touch on more, uh, touch more on this in a little bit. And so the other issue was that the temperatures changed very rapidly. There wasn't a nice gradual drop to ensure fish had enough time to prepare. It happened rather quickly. And as a lot of us Texans know, we can be in shorts in February and already planting our spring gardens. So this extreme freeze came as rather a shock. Even if we knew about it for a while, uh, the actual event was still quite surprising in terms of how bad it actually was. Um, I know I personally underestimated how bad this event was going to actually be. Um, so it was, it was very surprising. And again, a lot of you already know that. So <laughs> we also know Texas weather has a mind of its own and rarely, do, rarely does what the weathermen say it will. So maybe we're all kind of hoping, eh, it won't be that bad, right? Like those little snowflakes on the weather app, they'll disappear, not a big deal. Um, how wrong we were. And of course, um, because I am part of AgriLife Extension, I would like to note that agriculture of all kinds suffered during this event. Um, for example, the citrus industry took a massive hit and our ranchers unfortunately lost some livestock like cows and chickens and stuff. So this, this affected all kinds of agriculture. Um, definitely not an isolated event here. All right, moving on. Okay, it's not letting me, there we go. All right, <laughs> so um, we'll take a look first at our wild fish populations. And you can see this picture here on the right um, is from someone in um, Parks and Wildlife, the Coastal Fisheries Division, they had posted it. And so I snagged it off of there. Um, very, very neat picture, sad, but very cool um, to see. It just was something that I don't think any of us thought would happen. Um, so very crazy to see right there are the spotted sea trout literally frozen to death. Um, so this event led to the worst freeze related kill since the 80s. However, maybe some good news in it is that the overall number of fish killed this time appears to be lower than the significant freeze events that took place in the 1980s. Uh, typically fish try to seek refuge in deeper waters, which as I mentioned before, or provides more stable temperatures than the shallower water does. Unfortunately, in cases like this, a lot of fish don't make it out. Um, they got trapped either by tides or just couldn't find those deeper pockets because they aren't available in some areas along the coast like the Laguna Madre system. So the death toll that was released, and I'll, I'll put that number up here in a second, but I wanna preface it a little bit. Um, the death toll number that was released by Parks and Wildlife, and again, maybe some of you guys saw that press release come out, uh, they did note it to be an estimate. The number is based off of observations from their staff, local and state partners, and the biggest resource, of course, being the general public. Um, these agencies, those staffers, they can't be everywhere at once. The public is such a huge resource to um, agencies like Parks and Wildlife. So the numbers are also based off of sampling done by Parks and Wildlife. And no matter the rapid response and assessments that took place, the number is considered to still be a low estimate. And that is because fish mortalities were missed, um, not on purpose, but they were missed due to unsurfaced fish. Fish do sink eventually when they die. Um, immediate predation by birds and other animals who quite frankly capitalize on essentially the buffet that was presented to them. They have all these fish washed up on the shoreline there. Easy dinner, right? And of course, uh, fish counts were missed due to uh, death in inaccessible areas. Uh, can't get everywhere, right? Um, even by boat or walking, things like that. You just can't get to every area. So again, this death toll is uh, estimated to be low in that number. Is here. So they estimated about 3.8 million fish to be killed as a result of the freeze. They identified 61 species and due to predation and deterioration, some were ident unidentifiable. So let's see uh, the fish that took some of those hits. All right, so 91% of the estimated total comprised of non-recreational fish like your pinfish, spots, silver perch, hardheads, bay anchovies, Gulf Menhaden, and mullet. Now, you might be thinking, Nicole, that seems all right. The majority was just the little fish I don't even care to catch. And sure, 
Thankfully, only 9% of the total was an, uh, recreational species, but you have to remember what are our beloved recreational fish eating? The non-recreational ones, right? The little fish that are incredibly ecologically important and play a significant role in the health and diversity of marine ecosystems. So let's go back to better days in elementary school and learning about food chains. If there's no little organisms for the big organisms to eat, you're going to see a decline in those predators. And we'll chat more about that too here in a little bit. As I mentioned, 9% of the impacted fish were those recreational and game fish. Spotted sea trout took the biggest hit being 48% of the total. The Laguna Madre system had the highest death toll of the species and made up 89% of the spotted trout mortality along the coast. Um, if you're an angler, I don't have to tell you, you know that trout are pretty sensitive and this also goes for their temperature threshold. Spotted sea trout's lethal temperature is 42 degrees, whereas a red drums is 39 degrees. So it's no surprise that, um, sorry, so it's no surprise that the sea trout were topping the charts and more, topping the charts in mortality during this freeze. Next on our list was black drum at 31%. Again, the Laguna Madre system accounted for the majority of the total black drum mortality at 78%, followed by sheep's head at 8%, sand sea trout at seven, red drum at three, and we'll actually talk about redfish um, in the next slide a little bit. Gray snapper at 2%, red snapper at less than 1%. And for those of you tuning in from the Matagorda Bay area, uh, just an FYI, 533 spotted trout were recorded dead and the highest recreational species mortality we had was of sand sea trout at 2,904 dead. So there you go, just some highlights. All right, I want to, this is not, moving when I would tell it to. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so I want to go ahead and move on, move on to farm-raised stocks, um, especially those of farmed redfish. Now, many people don't actually, actually realize that redfish farming exists, but if you've ever ordered a redfish in a restaurant, you've had a farm-raised red. You just didn't know it. The commercial fishery for redfish was closed in the early 90s, uh, and that left us pretty dependent on imports and farm-raised stocks. Redfish farms, uh, like um, traditional farms and ranches in Texas, they, they took an incredible hit during the winter storm. You'll see this picture here on the right. Uh, these are all redfish that died as um, a result of the freeze. This was given to me courtesy of a farmer here in my county. And I mean, that's, that's devastating, absolutely devastating. So millions of dollars just in Matagorda County alone were lost to this devastation. Farms, uh, redfish farms took total losses, everything from the fingerlings to those um, harvest size, those ready to ship fish, everything died, everything. So if you recall now from a few slides ago, fish try to escape to deeper waters where temperatures are more stable and red's lethal temperature is 39 degrees and they only accounted for 3% of the mortality amongst recreational species. So why were the farm-raised reds hit so much harder than the wild stock? Well, for one thing, farm ponds are not very deep. It's not cost-effective and there's no need for it. So these ponds are only about four feet deep, leaving not a whole lot of place for these fish to seek refuge. They're left very vulnerable to the weather because well, it's not like you can just take them and put them somewhere else, right? Um, and there's only so much that you can really do to prepare them. So farmers did what they could and hoped for the best. Uh, unfortunately, at best, only the broodstocks survived. And the broodstocks are these moms and dads of the farm, the breeder fish, right? They're typically kept in an indoor facility on the property where light and temperature can be controlled to trigger uh, natural spawning cues. So unless the facility lost power for an extended period and the tanks got too cold, uh, these fish did okay. But even the broodstocks 
surviving barely offered a silver line, lining for farmers uh, because it does take about two years to get those market ready fish. So keep in mind, just like your cattle rancher depends on their cattle to make a living and support their business, so do redfish farmers. And I'm actually going to show y'all, hopefully it works, this news report that was sent to me by one of our local aquacultures, um, by one of our local farmers here, I think it helps tell the story maybe a little better than what I'm doing right now. So let's see if we can make this work. Okay, I'm gonna close that one. And we're gonna share a new screen. Sorry, bear with me one second here. Is this the one? That feels right, okay. Hopefully y'all can see this. Chloe, will you let me know? Um, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and play it and it's gonna play an ad. So we're just gonna be, oh gosh. Okay, I'm gonna mute that because, um, well, here it is. Here's this ad, can't skip it, so sorry. <laughs> um, I kept trying to like pull this up and have it ready, but it always had to replay an ad every time I visited the site. So sorry about that. Okay, here we go. Hopefully you can hear this. As a result of the big freeze here in Texas, and that includes the farm-raised redfish industry. Today, our Lexus Green spoke with aquaculture experts to find out just how devastating the losses were. It's not just the, the farms that have lost fish. This has devastated our bays and estuaries as well. According to Fritz Jenke, Executive Director of the Texas Aquaculture Association, Texas is the redfish capital and the largest supplier of redfish in the U.S. Jenke says the redfish industry experienced a devastating blow to the redfish farms following the unprecedented cold temperatures. Jenke says he is still working with farms to gather total losses to report back to legislators in the Ag Department. But the, it's looking like it could be in the neighborhood of $50 million dollars worth of loss of, of fish and uh, fingerlings. And so it's it's quite a heavy, heavy hit. But Jim S. Crom, owner of X Crom Enterprises in South Texas, says more than 200 million redfish that were lost were either market size or were works in progress, which has a direct impact not only on the farmers themselves, but the wholesale buyers, as well as us, the consumers. Uh, and that is the only source of redfish. Uh, for these restaurants and retailers since the uh, uh, since commercial catches were banned uh, decades ago. Brandon Bowers, owner and operator of Texas Mariculture, says the industry is needing immediate disaster relief and assistance, or farmers will find it very hard to rebound from this event. The bills don't stop. We still have land payments. We still have rent payments. We still have um, labor to clean the, the mess up out the capital uh, to move forward, some kind of assistance um, to bridge that gap, it will struggle to survive. Bauer says farmers could feel the effects of this disaster for the next two years as they try to rebuild. Lexus Green, 3 News. All right, great. Let me move over to my other screen again here. Um, okay, so hopefully that helped kind of tell the story a little bit more. Um, our redfish farmers are definitely um, in some, in some deep water right now and are, are looking for that relief. So just something to touch on because I don't know that, uh, everybody knows that this happens, you know, that redfish farming happens and how does it, um, how does it fare when events like this happen? I think, um, Texas traditionally, of course, we're going to think about those traditional farms and ranches, like our cattle and things like that and our crops and, and stuff. Um, so and all right, so I do want to quickly touch on some other species um, because everything is connected and I think it's just important for, for people to know. So I'm sure many of you guys saw pictures and videos of sea turtle recovery efforts um, make their way around the news circuit. This was a huge cold stunning event for sea turtles. The latest number that I heard was 12,500 reported cold stun turtles. That is, that's pretty big. Uh, sea turtles become cold stunned at 50 degrees. And if you come across one, it's, it's pretty hard, honestly, to tell if they're dead or just stunned, which is why they are taken to facilities for recovery. 
Um, and it actually sounds like uh, a lot of turtles got to be released and, and that's great. Otherwise, um, I, that, that could have been pretty bad. And you'll see over here on the right, some of those cold sun sea turtles uh, recovering and warming up over at Sea Turtle Inc. in South Texas there. Uh, oysters, they seem to have done all right. So yay, some good news. Um, they like the cold, but of course, if they were out of water and exposed due to changing tides, then yeah, unfortunately they, they, they froze to death. But overall they did pretty good. Uh, the oyster fishermen were actually out there as soon as they could be, I'm sure to make up for that lost time. Uh, you don't really find a lot of shrimp right now in the bays anyways, so hopefully the timing of the freeze worked out for them because they've already been in those deeper waters. So we won't really see anything about shrimp until later in the season, like the spring and everything like that. Farm-raised shrimp um, also seems to have done all right. Similar to their wild kin, they aren't around anyways, but in this case, meaning they aren't in the farm ponds and instead are packed away in freezers. So unless a farm lost power for a significant amount of time, uh, for those freezers to warm up. There, there were main, minor losses in farm-raised shrimp. Crawfish harvest, um, let's see, has, it did. Of course, it stopped during the freeze and now it seems to be doing all right. Thankfully, that's good news for crawfish lovers in our crawfish season. Uh, when it's cold, crawfish burrow into the mud and they stay dormant and they're not gonna come back out and reproduce until water temperatures reach about 65 to 60 degrees. The little picture I have here of this little juvenile crawfish, I took that after the freeze um, while I was at some wetlands and it looks like they were starting to warm up and come out. Uh, some ponds where I live, we saw some big crawfish coming out. So it seems like they, they did all right. So that's good news. Uh, crabs, they were similar to crawfish in that they escape and burrow. So they seem to fare all pretty well uh, too, unless of course there was traps <laughs> left out and they were stuck in there. And then uh, unfortunately, yes, they were, they were frozen to death. And of course our birds have pretty easy time. They can fly away. Um, after the freeze, I saw tons and tons of sandhill cranes flying around and flocking in spots, looking for something to eat. You'll see a huge flock of them here over some wetlands. So that was that was great to see. I know I saw them again on the property where I live. Um, so our birds seem to have done pretty good. Um, but this brings me now towards the, the end of my chat. I think I kept it kind of short and sweet there in the middle of our Wednesday here. Um, and this is looking ahead now to after the freeze. It's, it's been some time, right? Hopefully we've all thought out and uh, taken care of issues that we came across. Um, so while some species seem to have done all right, it'll actually be really interesting to see how the freeze affected um, new generations as those come about, right? So everything is connected. The loss of those little fish, which are just normally in bigger numbers than our recreational species, which maybe accounts for that, um, that big difference in loss, the 91 to the 9%. Um, they're just in bigger groups. Um, so the loss of those fish can potentially hurt the organisms that depend on them, like our bigger fish, like our game fish, right? And marine birds and marine mammals. But if the past is any indication, thankfully nature is resilient. Um, I believe a famous quote is, uh, nature uh, finds a way. I hope you're laughing out there. Otherwise, I feel really silly. <laughs> um, so after the 1980s freeze event, spotted sea trout numbers bounced back in about two to three years. Now that is just talking about overall numbers. That's not saying anything about their size or their age, strictly numbers. So there is hope yet. And that actually leads into what we can do as an immediate response to help our fish populations recover and in turn sustain those marine ecosystems. I've heard of fishing guides changing their trips to be catch and release or to take home enough for one meal. And some tournaments have also altered their guidelines as well in response to the recent kill. So if you are out fishing, which you should, by the way, please don't be discouraged. Um, fishing is a great way to see what's happening under the water, to see how our populations are doing. And as I said, 
before the public is the biggest resource for um, parks and wildlife and for those agencies that are working to protect and sustain our ecosystems, right? Again, they can't be everywhere. So they really do rely on um, the public being out there and fishermen love to tell fishing stories. So they'll be happy to let people know, hey, I did really good or hey, it hasn't been as good as it usually would be this time. So please still go out and fish. But if you are gonna go out and fish, um, maybe instead of keeping, oh my gosh, hold on one second. That's hilarious. That's why I need to close that um, page because then the ads keep playing. Sorry about that. Hope that woke you up a little bit. Um, <laughs> so like I was saying, uh, if you are out there, again, maybe don't keep the very biggest fish that you catch. Settle for some of the smaller ones, still legal size, of course, um, or just keep what you absolutely need to feed you and your family by letting go of those trophy fish, you are putting back those big mama fish into um, back into the wild, right? So that they can help sustain those populations because they're so essential to doing that. Um, by that size, they're pretty pro at egg production and they have great genes that should be passed along to help future generations of fish. And of course, help our future generations to continue enjoy them. Um, if you're fishing for fun rather than catching a meal, that's great too. Catch and release right now is a great way to ensure we help our populations. Uh, just remember to practice good fish handling though. For example, try to keep it in the water to, discreet, to dis decrease the stress on the fish, provide proper body support, don't put your fingers and hands in their gills, uh, try not to handle the fish by the lower lip. That's an easy way to kind of break their jaw and then well, that's not a fun story for them. And then gently remove the hooks um, as gently as possible. I know that can be tricky, right? Uh, routine sampling done by Texas Parks and Wildlife will also tell such a large part of the story on species recruitment and survival in the coming months and years. Hatcheries with the sole purpose of stocking efforts will probably be looking at what they can do to help supplement those wild populations and fishing regulations will, will be evaluated to see if any changes need to be made in order to help recovery efforts. And as much as you are able to, of course, try to support our locally so sourced products and our businesses um, to just help our farmers, our fishermen out. Um, you know, it's been hard for everyone in <laughs> the past what year now? I think almost almost a year. It's been tough, right? But I think the more we can all work together um, and support each other, we can maybe make it out of this a little bit easier. And um, as I promised, here's some pictures of Karankawa Bay. That's behind where I live or in front of, depending on which way you're looking at it. But we went out and looked at this and I mean, it was, it was frozen over and pretty much all the way to the next development over here. Um, I mean, I'm, I wasn't going to walk across and test that theory, but <laughs> you can see it was, it was pretty frozen. That was wild. Um, as cool as it was, I don't ever want to see this ever again in my life. No, thank you. All right. So just some people and agencies that kind of helped me uh, in guiding the discussion for today. I could not have done it without them. And you'll see here some parks and wildlife people already assessing some of the damages that were done on wild populations. And that's all I have. So thank you again, Chloe, for setting this up and to all of you who tuned in to listen. Hopefully I didn't bore you guys too much um, and I really appreciate it. Uh, let's see, maybe we do the last poll, Chloe, before we kind of get to those questions. And while that happens, I'm gonna read some of these questions. Ooh, these are good ones.
great. Awesome. Thank you guys again so much for, for filling that out. Um, Chloe, did you want to read questions or I, I can read them. I'm, I'm looking at them already, so I don't know why I'm asking. You can that. go ahead and read them. Um, so let me go ahead and see, look at some of these. Uh, somebody asked, is there a reason why recreational fish were impacted so much less than non-recreational fish? Um, that, that's a great question. A lot of these that I was reading while y'all were pulling are great questions and, um, Hopefully I can have some answers. And if not, please, 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 my information is down here at the bottom. If you want to screenshot it, write it down um, and shoot me an email or, hey, call me on the phone. Let's chat. Um, and I'll, I'd be happy to look up that information, um, whether it's just for your own curiosities or whatever that might be. I would love to get more information for you. Okay. So yes, uh, recreational fish impacted more or less than non-recreational fish. And again, I think it's just the, the way it is, right? There's always gonna be more of the little things so that it can sustain those bigger things. Um, but that's a great question. I actually might have to uh, talk to my parks and wildlife friends and see what they have to say about that because that's a great question. Um, I have two questions. What techniques were used to count all the fish that died? Why does sea turtles want to come up on the beach when it got cold? Great questions, Katie. I hope I'm saying that right, Katie. Um, so the techniques that are used, uh, obviously just counting, right? <laughs> um, if it's up on the beach, I, they went ahead and they counted them. Uh, I, I wasn't there for, for that, obviously. Um, that would have been really neat to have done though. But I think one of those techniques is they're just gonna be counting uh, those fish that are up there. Um, and that comes from, again, staff, uh, other agencies, the public, they're just writing down those reports as they're coming in, they're checking out those areas. And sea turtles don't necessarily want to come up to the beach when it gets cold. What's happening is they're getting stuck in those shallower waters. And as that temperature drops, because again, this was not a like gradual drop, this happened pretty quickly. And some of the animals just weren't prepared for that. And again, because sea turtles are stunned at 50 degrees, as opposed to some of our fish that are stunned at like 39 or 40, um, their threshold is so much lower, um, even though the temperature is technically higher. So um, yeah, they're not trying to come up, but when they get stunned like that, the water's obviously just gonna brush them up on, on the shore. So great questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move to the chat really quick so I get to everyone here. Um, were there any sharks or higher predators affected? Not that I have heard and not that I'm aware of. That's a really good question, Stephanie. That'd be something um, I'd have to look into because um, I haven't heard anything. I haven't heard anything. That's a good question. Again, uh, any effects on things like jellyfish? that are at the surface as adults. I'm sure there were tons of little Tina fours and things like that that unfortunately didn't make it out or weren't able to go and um, escape. And some of those jellies are kind of at the will of the water. Um, so I'm sure a lot of them were, were taken to, I haven't really looked into the numbers of some of our inverts like that. That's a great question. Um, Morgan, Tony, Kate. Hey, thanks guys, that's really sweet. Um, Dusty, is that Dusty? I think so. Um, I was also curious about bull sharks since the juveniles live in base rivers, tributaries, are they just tougher? <laughs> bull sharks are pretty tough. Having personal experience <laughs> with bull sharks, uh, those suckers are pretty darn tough in terms of like temperatures and stuff. Um, hopefully they detected those rivers, um, those temperatures starting to get colder and they were able to make it out. Uh, I haven't seen any pictures of sharks or anything like that. Um, again, that's a really great, that's a really great question. Thank you for asking. And uh, again, something I want to look into now, y'all are definitely sparking some questions in my own mind that I just uh, didn't really think to think about yet. Um, I understand that TPWD will sample in April. Any idea how long after that, they will make decisions based on date. I'm not going to speak to that um, just because I'm not sure. And I don't want to sit here and lie to y'all. That's not fair either. Um, but I'm not sure. But rest assured that uh, the decisions that they make, if if they make any, they may look at it and be like, eh, things are okay. Um, but if they make any decisions, they are going to really mull those over um, and make sure that they are what's best for those populations, right? So I'm not sure how long any of that might take. That's a good question. We're, we'll all sit and wait for, for that together. When might fishing regulations change? Okay, yeah, same, same thing. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure. I think they have a lot of things to kind of mull over. 
right now, people went out in boats and picked up turtles in the, yes, uh, Kate, absolutely. If this is Kate from Sea Grant, Kate, you were, you were part of that, you and Tony, some of my colleagues uh, were down there and picked up turtles. Uh, it was, it was crazy. You can definitely see lots of pictures if you go to the Sea Grant Facebook page or you just Google right now, sea turtle cold stunning in Texas. It, it should pop up and you'll just see pictures and pictures of people putting turtles in boats in truck beds whatever they can to get those guys out of the cold and into something a little warmer. Um, I think that's all the questions. Chloe, does it look like I missed anything? Um, Not that I can see. I think you've got them all. Awesome. These things are so weird because you kind of feel like you're chatting to yourself. Um, <laughs> like I'm literally doing right now. I am, oh, oh, what's this one? Oh, it Aaron, I am a junior, almost senior at a and Gallatin. Hey, awesome. I graduated in 2014 um, and, and, and very interested in the impact of the freeze on local fishes. Is there any way to get involved at TPWD to survey this? That's a super great question. Erin, I want you to right now, write my email down and email me so we can be in contact. So let's do that. I know right now, um, at least the field station I talked to, um, we'll have to see about the ones in your area, but I'm assuming it's kind of the same across the board. They're not really taking volunteers right now, of course, because of COVID, but I'm sure as things start to move forward here, um, they love volunteers normally. That's how I got started. Um, so fun fact, I used to work for Parks and Wildlife and that's how I got started was as a volunteer. It's a great foot in the door. If I'm talking to any other um, AM Galveston or just marine biology or science fisheries, whatever people, uh, that's a great way to get your foot in the door, volunteer with Parks and Wildlife, or if you're interested in, in sea turtle recovery, uh, find those places like Sea Turtle Inc. or Padre Island National sea Seashore. Uh, please volunteer. They love it. Of course, on, on normal times, but here we are in the wildest of times, so who knows anymore. But Erin, I really hope you emailed or wrote my email down. Um, get in contact with me. Okay. You can also become a Texas Master Naturalist. Yes, Angela, you can do that. Definitely do that. Those people are fantastic and just a wealth of knowledge. So see if you can get involved in that. The Galveston chapter is very active and they're fantastic. And I know who to get you in contact with them um, too, so. Okay. Well, I think that's it if we don't have well, any- Well, thanks y'all. Um, I appreciate it again. Hopefully you learned something and we're kind of engaged. Um, all right. That's all I have. Chloe, if there's nothing else, I guess we're, we're done here. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was a really great chat. I loved it so much. And I and hope everyone learned silence on my end. <laughs> can you hear me? If there are no further questions, I'm assuming y'all can probably log off. Um, thank you again. And, uh, yeah, I guess we'll shut this down. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good week.